Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ. This is episode number 89 and today, amongst the questions of yours that I answer about the knives, we're looking at some of the best budget machetes out there as well as some knives that move you. Let's get into it. All right, if you're new to this series, I do answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. Well, more specifically, some of your questions. For a chance to get featured in a future episode, comment section down below is where you want to leave those questions. We'll go through and pick out some good ones, hopefully good ones, hopefully you think they're good ones, for a future episode. First question today comes from Eddie Daly, who says, asks, what is the best moving knife? I'm moving soon. I know I'm going to need a knife to help with unpacking. Well, this feels very appropriate for me personally, because as we shared in a short a couple months ago, almost just over three months to be exact, I started a move three months ago and it drug on. A lot of things happened to push the, uh, the move in to the new place back, but between getting our house on the market, spending several weeks in a hotel, at Blade Show, I was technically homeless when uh, we went there earlier this year, and then getting into the new house, it was a three month process. It feels so good to finally be in, be in the house, and now we're in that unpacking stage that you mentioned. In that short though, I, uh, I showed three knives because I spent a little bit of time thinking about this as well. Um, and we'll go through uh, my thought process on the knives I chose, and hopefully this can give you a little uh, maybe insight into what you might want to look for. Um, the three things that uh, that came to mind that I was going to need was obviously something that's going to cut through cardboard really well. Not just, you know, unpacking stage, but in the packing part of it, if you need to break down some trash cardboard to fit in the bin, invariably I would find myself, uh, you know, cutting down strips or spacers to help with the packing process a bit. Uh, so cardboard slicing is going to be a good thing reliability because I didn't know how long I was going to be without the bulk of my knife collection. Even though I did cheat a little bit and I, I did pack all my knives except for a couple that I left accessible-ish, but I brought them all here into the office. More on that later. But reliability was going to be very important because if I'm only going to have, you know, a knife around most of the time, I don't want it to fail. And then edge retention because again, didn't know how long I was going to be without my main sharpening rig. A little way to get around that, um, I do carry in my uh, my daily bag this Benchmade EDC sharpener. What's the name of it specifically? Uh, it is the, uh, the EDC Edge Maintenance Tools made by WorkSharp because you've got a ceramic rod there, which I never had to use, but I love having that tiny bit of strop loaded with black compound. These are pretty expensive for what they are, I will admit. They're about 50 bucks, but another good option and I, I definitely would recommend if you don't have one already, I love this as just a little portable unit, the micro sharpener from WorkSharp. 13 bucks for one of these. You have a ceramic rod. If you need more aggressive, you have a diamond rod here on the top side with angle guides if you want to use those. And on top of that, three Torx bits on the inside that clip in to that tool itself. So you've got most of what you need for daily knife maintenance besides maybe a little bit of oil. Really inexpensive and really low profile too. You can stick that just about anywhere. But even so, I wanted to make sure edge retention was high enough in the priority list. It didn't have to be, you know, the most edge retentionist steel out there, but one of the knives I looked at was my trusty Sebenza 21 in Singo. This, this is a very solid knife. It is an extremely reliable knife. I think I, I have one time had to tighten a screw on this and even that was it. The lockup is strong. You've got a great blade shape here for breaking down cardboard and doing that sort of thing. And the S35 VN steel on this particular knife right here, while not the most edge retention steel out there, is still giving me plenty of life to work with and I've got my strop there on the side. In the end, I went with a different knife because I tend to prefer the way a, a thin bladed flat ground knife cuts through cardboard a little bit more than the hollow grind on this Sebenza. Even though I have cut cardboard down with this knife plenty of times with no problem, 
you know, we're talking subtleties in the experience of moving through that material in this case. But I wanted to go with a thinner flat ground blade. The Delica is a great option, and especially in the K110 steel right here. Insane edge retention with that stuff. K110? We, did I say K110? K390, there's so many K, there's a K340 steel coming out now. Apologies, K390 steel. Insane edge retention with that stuff. Uh, in fact, if you checked out, we did a cardboard slayers video and this thing absolutely destroyed cardboard. It was phenomenal, it continues to be phenomenal. Thin flat ground blade, excellent sliciness through the cardboard. Bit of a hybrid blade shape, I always say, with, uh, with the Delica. I think of it as kind of like a modified Warncliffe in a way. Not so much in its actual visual shape, but in how it interfaces with what you're cutting. It's kind of similar to that. You know, take that with a grain of salt for sure, but I think it's illustrative nonetheless. The lock back here is nice and solid. This is a reliable knife. You're dealing with very simple construction. I've never had to adjust uh, the screws on any of the Delicas I've owned over the years, which is, well, three, I guess. I have a Delica three that I still own. Had an old Delica four in VG10, but now this is my, uh, my go-to Delica right here. Really solid. The one thing actually that I didn't get into uh, of things I was looking for was uh, the speed of opening and closing the knife came into play a little bit. This is certainly a quick knife to open and close, but it's a little more deliber deliberate, a little bit more thought goes into choosing that or into operating that. So in the end, I went with my bug out, which may be kind of a boring choice. It is one of my most frequent EDCs anyway, but it has a thin flat grind. So it slices cardboard really well. The blade shape is maybe a little less optimized for big long cuts through cardboard due to the, uh, the belly of the drop point here. I'll get to more of that in a little bit. And the speed of the axis lock works really well for me because as you're moving and grooving, getting stuff packed, you're not thinking as much maybe about knife safety as you should be, but you can have your knife out, make a quick cut, close it, still have it in your hand while you're manipulating other things and keep doing that. And I, I found myself doing that a lot. And you've got that great blade shape. S30V, again, good enough edge retention for what I was looking for. Now, I will say, however, the reliability did come into play for me for this. One thing that, you know, I've only ever had happen to me once, but other people have experienced this, those Omega Springs can break. Didn't break an Omega Spring while I was uh, doing the move, but as you can see, I've got aftermarket Flytanium G10 handles on here. I love this shape, the uh, crossfade scales here. I love the pinch grip there at the front, feels great. But because I took the original knife apart, there was no, and I, I, I this is my fault, I neglected to add any uh, low strength Loctite to the screws and I lost a screw out of the side of this. And rather than keep running it, which I could have done, I cheated and I came in here to work and swapped my bug out out for my bailout. <laughs> Very similar. Um, I should say it bailed you out. It did in fact. Um, and in fact, I think this probably should have been my, uh, my choice rather than the bug out. When I was putting those three knives up, I should have put this up rather than the bug out from the off. Reason being, you've still got that axis lock uh, speed that I like. You've got a little bit more handle and an even more stable feel even than the G10 handles there. Blade shape, a little bit better possibly for cardboard than the bug out because again, a little less belly out near the tip. It's not gonna be quite the same as a, uh, a Warncliffe style blade. And the reason, if you're not sure why I'm talking about that is with a drop point, as you're pushing through towards the end of a cut through cardboard, it's a little easier for the knife to kind of slip out. Again, watch that Cardboard Slayers video we did. You can see that kind of happen. Uh, as we're demonstrating stuff. This one has more straight edge uh, than the uh, drop point blade does. So it's, a, and, but it, it does still kind of go up with the, uh, the Tonto shape there. And this is where I'm gonna start talking about the unpacking phase of things. And this is why I'm glad I went with something unlike that sheep's foot blade, the, Inc the uh, Incosi blade on, or sorry, Insingo blade on my Sabenza. Pardon me, they're my knives, don't worry. I like that the bailout and the bug out have some drop 
to the spine, some downward curvature. Because when I've been unpacking, especially if you've used movers like we did, where things get wrapped up in a lot of tape and you wanna be real careful about not cutting into what's underneath, I love the ability of something like that drop point to come in, get under what you need to slice open and rock back to lift that tip up just a little bit. Then you can kind of run along whatever you're needing to open up without worrying about digging down into it. The Delica does have a little bit of that. Previous versions or generations of this knife came to a very acute point, but they dropped the tip just a little bit on the Delica 4. And you can do that lift as well with that. But again, I already talked about liking the speed of the bug out. And that's definitely something that's harder to do that lift with a sheep's foot blade. You can still do it, but the rather than the force you're putting running along what you're cutting, you're having to kind of pull it along and it's a little bit easier to dig in a little more with that. The bailout still has me covered there. Not quite as good as the, uh, the full-fledged bug out because the, the little back of the uh, thumb ramp there gets in the way a little bit, but you can still lift up and the Tonto comes in really handy here as well. If you have a box that's really full and a one way I occasionally use a Tonto when coming in opening the tape is I'll grip it up near that secondary point and use that as the leading edge. So I can really finely control with my fingertips how deep that's gonna go in. Yes, you can still do that with a tip of a knife, but there's something real nice about doing it with that edge of the Tonto right there. I hope this is helpful. I know I've rambled a lot for, you know, for the answer to this question, but I thought about it a lot as I was going through it. So hopefully take what you like and uh, augment it with your own experiences as well. But th those are what you wanna look for, I think. Reliability, ease of, or not ease of sharpening. Let me, start, let me start over with that. What you need is reliability enough edge retention to get you through the move and then some, because you don't know what's gonna delay you, and cardboard and maybe something with a, a curved spine to help with the unpacking. Your mileage may vary, of course, but I found that to be extremely helpful for me. And I'm gonna continue to find it extremely helpful because we still have a lot of stuff to unpack, but it feels so good to be done with the moving part. All right. Next question comes from Golden Badger. Uh, not that they use them as part of their work, though. What are some knives you'd recommend for a real estate agent? Shout out to our realtor who was a fantastic partner in finding this place. Finally, this person also volunteers for Habitat for Humanity and enjoys beer. Could this be a Golden Badger himself talking about him or herself? Maybe. Could be. Well, <laughs> it's like, what? Thinking like, what are you gonna give to a, a real estate agent? Like what's, what makes it a, a realtor's knife? And the only thing I could think of was something that was maybe a little more uh, like civilized than something like really tactical, well, or something really kind of workaday or, or, or blue collar like the Delica. Um, wouldn't want something super tactical for the realtor either, I don't think. Um, but then your other two caveats, your Habitat for hum Humanity and your enjoying beer part, not necessarily you, could be you, allegedly, um, crystallized things for me. Some kind of classy looking multi-tool. And when it comes to that, my first and last stop are the Alox handled Swiss Army knives. This is the Farmer X. Because you're doing Habitat for Humanity, you got a couple tools here, in addition to the blade, of course, that could be really useful. That all with the scraping edge and the piercing point and that nice little wood saw. Could come in handy in a pinch for some detail cuts. I can be making, you know, cutting through two by fours with them, but very nice. If you enjoy beer, you got your cap lifter right there. Very nice. A couple little uh, turners. Actually, that uh, cap lifter can come in handy if there's a screw that needs to be turned. Not that a realtor should be like messing around with the property they're showing, but maybe there's, I think of those, uh, those door locks that sometimes get locked, but you can just turn with the, uh, the screwdriver from the outside. Could be handy. A pair of scissors, because a pair of scissors is always nice keeping uh, presentable for meetings with clients. You can trim uh, errant beard hairs or man or woman, yeah, we don't know, or uh, hanging uh, strings or something from the clothing. And of course your knife blade as well. And of course it looks classy, so 
That would be my, my realtor's recommendation, whether you like beer or not. All right, next question comes from Tagwash88. Uh, hi, DCA and crew. That's Thomas behind the camera, of course. Hey. Um, I hope you are all doing fine. I was wondering if it is a good idea to trim bushes and hedges with a machete. And if yes, which one would be a good bu budget option for that task? Thank you. Um, thank you, sir. First, is it a good idea? I say absolutely yes. And for me, I have actually I have a handful of machetes I reach for for yard work, but the one I probably reach for the most these days is my Condor Makara. It's awesome. It's an 18 inch, 1075, I think, carbon steel blade, two handed grip in you know South African or South African, South American hardwood. <laughs> But anyway, I think these are a lot of fun. They're certainly effective, and there's a lot of reach with this one, whether you're choking back using one hand or you need a little more meat behind the swing with both. Is it a good idea? Yes, one, because it works, and two, it's never a bad idea to let the neighbors know you might be a little bit crazy. It could come in handy in certain neighborhoods. More so in my previous neighborhood than the new neighborhood so far, but it's not too bad. My, uh, my, my main move actually would be heading out to the front yard with one of these, in a pair of athletic shorts and flip flops and just start swinging away. Got cuts, cuts down on the mask and for sugar. You gotta keep them guessing, I'm mm -hmm. telling you. And especially in that old neighborhood, Thomas knows. He visited me there once or twice. Just once. It was just the one, yeah. We scared him off after that one time. Um, these are cool, not really a budget option though, um, but I brought that out to say, yes, it is a good idea and I use this one. I mean, the cost on that particular machete is like 131 bucks. Not cheap, uh, especially for something that's going to be swinging around, dinging into things. But it exhibits a blade shape that is similar to this, the Ontario 18-inch uh, D-ring machete. Or they, this is called the Ontario Field Machete, the 18-inch blade, $26 for this. And if I were picking something new and sticking to a, uh, a strict budget, I would want something at least 18 inches long, I think, for the reach and I would want something with a uh, Latin style heritage like this because you've got that upswept belly near the blade meeting the straight spine on the back. My Makara isn't quite Latin. It's kind of this weird, you know, hybrid Tonto-ish shape, but it has the same kind of things that make the Latin machete work for hedges and branches like you mentioned. Because when you get that length and you get that swinging around with that velocity with this sharp edge along there, it can really swing through some of those things. And this brings me to a caveat though. You can see right here, the edge gets really blunt out here towards the tip. We're sharp, decently sharp along the whole way until you get about halfway down that belly where things widen up and you, you lose that sharpened edge. This is about setting expectations. When we're dealing with true budget machetes, pretty much everything out there is a little rough around the edges. Is that fine? That's up to you to decide. But you may need to spend a little bit of time with a grinder or some files maybe even to reset the bevel out here near the tip. But Ontario is a great company to look for for budget machetes. Like I said, a little rough around the edges. We'll get to more rough around the edges examples here. The D-ring models right here are a little bit nicer than the kind with the bolt-on handles because those handles are a little rougher around the edges than the D-ring here. Because we're over-molded the tang, you've got pretty much seamless stuff going on where a lot of times you'll have some uh, mismatched handles to blade tangs. You have to you know file the handles down so, to avoid that hot spot. Ontario is a great brand. Uh, Tramontina, even though we don't sell them here, is a great brand. You folks know I've got a, a modified one uh, that I've used for years. Even that one didn't have a, a sharpened belly out here near the front. I had to mess with that uh, before it was usable. And then I cracked the handles trying to clean them up a little bit, which is why I put those custom handles on it. We'll leave a link to that video there. Really nice, they don't come with a sheath. Again, setting expectations for budget machetes. Uh, Ontario Tramontina and Cold Steel, I think is a great, company to look for for budget machetes. Um, this is not a Latin style machete, but they have, ooh, pardon me, uh, they do have Latin style machetes in their machete range. They have a really broad range of budget machetes. This is their 18 inch slant tip model, which might have a little more power for a, a straight on hit perhaps, 
than a Latin style machete and a little easier to use the tip if you have yard work that requires tip use, but you don't have that same kind of slashy quality towards the tip. These do come with a decent sheath. And when you're dealing with something like this knife here, machete that costs 28 bucks, decent is fantastic. You know, you uh, that's kind of all you can hope for and really expect. Nylon, a couple snaps, even a belt carry in this uh, this case. So that's pretty good. Let's try on that there. Rough around the edges a little bit. I've seen, uh, they kind of vary from batch to batch it seems. Sometimes the sharpened edge on them is pretty good. This one right here you can see has a pretty aggressive burr, pretty much the full length. So you're gonna have to spend a little bit of time with your sharpening gear before being able to put this to use. Again, setting expectations. Once it does have a sharp edge on the, the on it though, these things work very well. They've been proven to work, well, they've been proven to be very durable. And the cool thing about the broad range that Cold Steel has on their budget range of machetes is there's a ton of shapes. The Latin stuff, you've got stuff like that. You've got machetes shaped like kukris. You've got a lot of indigenous patterns. You've even got stuff that's really more inspired by well, one perfect example, the Roman Gladius, a double-edged short sword. They do a machete version of that as well. So you get to play with a lot of different blade shapes without spending a whole lot of money, which can be very instructive. You can kind of learn what some different blade shapes are good for and what they're not good for too. So that's a great option. Uh, one more budget option I will mention is this sword. It's the mini cane machete. It's like $37 and Comes with a really nice convex edge, I gotta say. Not super thick, so you can move it around quickly. The cane style machete has a bit more mass here at the front for more choppy tasks, which again, depending on what type of foliage you have in your backyard, may or may not be useful. You've got a hook here on the back, which is not sharpened, so you're not gonna use it as a trimming hook, but you might be able to use it as a pulling hook if you need to pull a branch that's out of your reach into your reach to get to it, to cut. Uh, and it comes also with a decent sheath. It's kind of a, uh, I believe it's fake leather on the outside. It may, it feels kind of rubbery, uh, lined with fire hose on the inside. If you are fine with maybe spending a little bit of time making sure your machete's in tip top shape by spend, you know, by sticking with the budget options, then by all means go for it. On this sword, this one would actually be really easy. It just has a bit of a, uh, a sharp seam there from the mold where these two join. A little bit of sandpaper and this thing's ready to go for 37 bucks. But if you want something that you don't wanna have to mess with at all, I think you might have to spend a little bit more money. For me, I would go for something like the Half a Chance, a Canadian design from CRKT, it's like 58 bucks. Handle is ready to go right out of the box. Not worried about modding that at all. The edge itself, nicely convex and pretty highly refined too, for a machete especially. And this kind of parang shape is gonna give you a little bit more of a stronger hit, less so with the slashing maneuvers, but still is going to work for that sort of thing. And a pretty full featured sheath here as well. Nylon, plenty of extra strapping. It's not too much uh, more evolved than the, uh, the cold steel one we looked at earlier, but again, we're still dealing with only 60 bucks in this case. Uh, and the strap here can kind of move out of the way so the retention isn't the best, the best. But anyway, we used to be able to talk about Condor as a budget machete brand, but I don't think that's the case anymore. I mean, the cheapest machetes right now are over 70 bucks. Decently priced, yes, but not budget. Hope this helps. All right, that brings us to this, the feature we call Measured Once, Cut Twice, where we take a second stab at some previous information I gave you. And in this case, I'm using it to, uh, as an addendum for uh, the new Knives of the Week episode, not from a couple days ago, but from the week prior, uh, where you folks set me straight and I had some information that didn't make it into the video that should have. The first, I'll, uh, I'll read this one. Dr. Beat, it's B3AT, I think it's Beat. Uh, I believe that Hiccup from Kaiser has an optional thumb stud you can attach. Yes, it does. Um, I compared this to the, uh, or I had this along with the front flipper version, which had a more regular thumb hole, whereas this one looks kind of like a keyhole. And yes, there is a thumb stud, dual thumb stud actually, see right there, that you can attach in that little keyhole. 
and that's what it does. But you know what? Thomas unpacked the, that uh, batch of knives before filming and he left those in the box. I think he did it to mess with me. I regret nothing. <laughs> nor should you. So that's what this knife would look like with the thumb stud when open. You can see there, obviously I didn't actually screw in the other side because I don't want to mess with that right now. Uh, and it looks like that when closed. So you can run that with or without that, whichever you prefer. It's kind of cool. Uh, so yes, thank you to the several folks who mentioned that because uh, we actually didn't have that information on our product page and I didn't know about it. So thank you. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is I talked about the Gerber Savvy in that video. And the more I kind of handle this knife, the more happy I am with it. And the more happy I am that Gerber's doing such a good job. And it's not just that they looked at what else was out there and tried to equal it. They actually did something one better than any of the other crossbar lock makers that I know of are doing right now. And I didn't get to mention this in the video because I didn't realize it. Check out these washers. You can actually see the little bit of copper or, or bronze, phosphor bronze there on the outside because they kind of took a cue from something like the Chris Reeve Inkosi. Really big washers. And in this case, they actually go around the stop pin at the back. And because of that, that's what gives you the virtually wiggle free crossbar lock experience, which as I mentioned in that video, is virtually impossible to do. Everyone, even the best makers out there, I'm a really big fan of Hoag's crossbar lock, even they have a little bit of wiggle to them. This really doesn't. So kudos to Gerber for really, not just trying to equal what else was out there, but actually going further and doing one better than the big names in this genre. Really, really cool. And there were a couple of you who mentioned that in the comments section as well. Um, but it was funny, I realized that Seth and I were talking about this knife right after we filmed, and he pointed that out and was like, dang, I should have had that information in there. But now it's here. Which brings us to the lightning round for today. Hey DCA, just wondering why more blade makers do not use Vanax. Seems like an amazing steel, thanks. Um, it is, uh, but the thing with it is like every step along the way seems to add cost. Uh, the formula is actually difficult to make um, to, while keeping all of the elements in solution, particularly the nitrogen. It tends to want to like gas off and float away from the steel. Um, it's made in Europe, so for a lot of the uh, American manufacturers, you're, you're adding uh, shipping and importation costs across the, uh, the ocean, of course. Um, it's difficult to work with as well. It's very hard to machine. It's going to take longer and use more consumables to actually shape the blade, which is, of course, going to add cost which is why you really only see this steel in uh, small batch stuff or sprint runs these days, but it is fantastic stuff. Uh, Dennis Hurley asks now, you touted the flat grind on the new Elementum button lock as an improvement over the hollow grind of the older version. I prefer the hollow grind because it maintains a thin edge after multiple sharpenings. What is the advantage of the flat grind? Well, the simple answer is, I mean, we could go real deep into this, but we don't really need to. The simple answer is it's, a little bit of a trade-off, it adds a little more strength behind the edge. Your angle is, yes, going to be a little more obtuse than if it were hollow ground and the uh, thickness behind the edge was the same. But depending on what you're cutting, as you move up the blade, there is a more consistent angle of friction. I think cardboard is a perfect example of this. So you, you maintain that constant angle as, go, as you're going through, whereas with a hollow grind, I'll show the uh, Sabenza here as an example. I mentioned I like a flat grind better when I was talking about this earlier for cardboard. When you get to the top of that shoulder, all things being equal versus a flat ground blade, you're dealing with a even more obtuse angle than anywhere on the flat ground blade. And depending on how thick your hollow ground blade is, that can be more of a problem or not too much of a problem at all. There's obviously degrees here across the range, but that would be the, uh, the nutshell of what the advantages of the flat grind flat grind would be a little more strength for stability when pushing through stuff like that and a little more consistent angle control all the way along so you're not dealing with a little bit more resistance at the end of a cut hope that helps and it's 20 cv so you won't be sharpening it as much that is true versus a uh, a the, what's the uh, standard versions the 14c 28n yes or is it nitro v it's one of the two 
Um, so you will be sharpening that more than something like the 20 CV for sure. Which brings us to the most serious question of the day, which comes from Scott Gudmestad. Uh, most serious question, blade shape of choice when fending off honey badgers, the ferocious mongoose, or yeti? Reverse tanto, he asks. Thomas? Probably. Eh. Disagree, you're wrong again. The answer is spear point. Preferably when attached to the end of a big spear shaft like this cold steel boar spear here that is unwieldy behind the filming table, but you've got double edged here. You can actually say leaf point in this case. It's a sharp leaf. <laughs> anyway, that is clearly the correct answer. That's all the questions we have for today. Remember, leave your questions in the comments section below for a chance to have it featured in a future episode. If you wanna get your hands on any of these knives, links in the description will take you over to knifecenter.com. And always remember, we've got our Knife Rewards program, because if you're gonna be putting your money down on one of these knives today, you might as well earn some free money to spend on your next one. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center, and that's Thomas behind the camera. We're signing off. See you next time.